think that 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 integration that that merge point a is gonna is gonna occur probably faster than we can even imagine right now that that's my hypothesis first from the time stamp just given like the three earlier points how everything is changing so fast and looking at the trends in the past i think we're definitely heading towards that place where that integration of the two is 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 not only good going to be be it's not going to be avoidable. It's going to become necessary right. and, and kind of common day practice for sure. Well, Alex, thank you so much, as I said earlier, for taking the time out of your day to be here, uh, to get on the podcast. I've been anxiously awaiting this conversation, if I'm being honest, uh, ever since talking to Chris. Artificial intelligence is something that's it sparked my interest a long time ago. I find it fascinating and I'm really excited to chat with you about it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invite. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I mean, um, obviously, I'm, 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 I love this space and love talking to people about it. Um, and, you know, I talk to people at different levels, right? People that are really like deep into it and those that are more kind of interested. So um, I'm, I'm excited to have this discussion with you. And um, I love the podcast you did with um, with Chris. Well, thank um, you. And it, was, it was wonderful that you that you reached out. And, and thank you for doing this. I mean, to, to kind of bring attention to all of the important aspects, not, you know, not in my case, the AI. But like all the right. other things that you're doing, which is pretty exciting. Well, yeah, I, I think that, I mean, this is even a great place to start it, is the gap between those who really understand deep learning, understand machine learning or working on projects or someone like yourself who we hope will become a staple in the, the regulation and management of the relationships that we have with AI. And then someone maybe like myself, who's, you know, more of a, a layman or, or a consumer passively of artificial intelligence. You know, I use... Uh, I'll be writing an email and it'll finish my sentence. I'll be using a search engine. There's a lot of interactions yeah. that someone like myself would have. I happen to be interested in it, but it would be very easy to go about your daily life and not really even understand how frequently you're interacting with this stuff. And I mean, I'm sure we'll, we'll get into all the the potential risks and concerns and the excitement around it. But yeah. given what you do with Trust Vector, one thing that I thought would be interesting to do is to ask you, what do you define as trust? Because I feel like that, that really lays the framework probably for the majority of our discussion here yeah. as we will then apply it to different areas. But when you think about that, what does trust mean to you, Alex? Yeah, so, uh, and, and it's a really good question to start with, right? Because um, we as human beings, uh, and, and this is something that I, I've been thinking about about quite a bit as I was thinking about, well, how do we, how do we figure out, how do we trust artificial intelligence and why is it so hard? And I'll get into why it is so hard. But what I kind of managed to kind of boil it down to is that, first of all, we as human beings are actually genetically wired to detect trustworthiness. And you may be aware there was a study in 2012 that came out of University of Toronto in, in Berkeley and a few other places where they determined that human beings are able in about 20 seconds just imagine 20 seconds, be able to tell whether another human being is trustworthy, compassionate, um, you know, whether, whether they're, they're empathetic. And these and range from out, social cues and eye contact, correct. motherly feelings, correct. et cetera. Exactly, right. And, and that's fascinating, right? So, so we, we, we as human beings are able to do that you know, towards another human being, right? And there's apparently some, some genetics that are very, very tied to this and genetic code that is either missing or not missing with the person you're talking to or you're thinking whether they're trustworthy or not. To do a similar thing with a, with a system, with, with, a, with a, anything that we're kind of dealing with, as you just said, on a daily basis, is, is, is really, really hard task. And, and as I kind of started to think about those parallels of those universes it's kind of one universe we live in but we have two components to it like this human interaction then human machine interaction um i kind of realized that it, it is no doubt that in general it's it's hard to define the trust towards something that you know google maps told me or something that siri told me or right. something that a, that a restaurant recommendation told me without even realizing like you said that there's a bunch of artificial intelligence behind it that is helping us Right. Um, so that's where I kind of always start when I talk about trustworthiness first from the human perspective, kind of just being able to understand why this is so hard to, to, to even think about. The bad news is it, it gets even more complex now, right? So, so first, <laughs> yes. firstly, Indeed. right, firstly, as, yes. as human beings, we're, we're, we're kind of wired to trust another human being. Now we need to trust this, you know, which then let's call it for the, for the sake of argument, kind of a black box. There's, there's right. going to give us the right recommendation. 
right? Um, there's a good quote that I read um, somewhere. I don't remember where it was, but it said something along the lines that, you know, trustworthy artificial intelligence is based on this idea that artificial intelligence itself will reach its full potential um, once the trust can be established through all of the components of the life cycle of the AI. From so what learning we, to application to... Right, from starting even with a design, starting even from the thinking about when do you use artificial intelligence to solve something, how do you even trust the decisions that early on are being made correctly, that you're using the right type of AI, that you're solving the right problem with it, that you are you know, not already at that point in time incorporating biases, which are only going to get worse and amplified, right? Through the actual implementation and now actually putting the models together and actually choosing the data sets and, and, and kind of working through it and then maintaining it once it goes live. Right. So the whole point of it, right, is to evolve. Um, sometimes, in some cases, it learns on its own, um, but in a lot of cases, it still needs human interaction to continue to evolve and, and, and learn, right? Um, and to me, that, that statement was very powerful because, I, um, you know, the, the idea in my mind truly is there. We have this wonderful, wonderful capability, wonderful technology that can really help us solve some really big problems. But if and only if we can trust it, and if right. and only if it can be applied, you know, for good, if you well, want. Well, there, there's certainly a, an early issue that arises here pretty quickly is variations in morals and ethics that exist inherently between social groups or countries, cultures, societies, right? Like uh, the values held in Israel may be different than the values held in the United States, and those may differ from those in China. And if you are building something to... And, and trying to trust it in the process, it's only its ability to be trusted is limited to how those that de design the program believe trust is, right? So as right. they build it, their morals, their values, their ethics will pour into the code, into the testing, into the learning, and into the parameters that measure whether or not this thing is moving in the right direction. So. Right. And in a way, this is a huge jump ahead to what you're doing. But how do you solve for those differences yeah. when you're working in a competitive environment, right? You don't you, yeah. you want to be first to the moon in this situation. Right. So how do you maintain so, those ethics? Yeah. And, and you know, the, the first to the, to the moon is a very important piece. It kind of led us to where we are right now, right? Um, I, I, I kind of coined a little saying, you know, in the last, you know, you know, few few years, and especially in the last years, I've been talking more and more about trustworthy AI, which is that AI has left the lab very quickly and entered the boardroom, but everything that is supposed to surround it um, has is really lacking, and and it's and it's and it's you know trying to catch up. Meaning regulations and standards, all of the things that exactly to what you're saying help us eliminate this this ambiguity of, well, does somebody interpret things this way in this country and does somebody interpret things differently in a different country? Everything that is supposed to be there to give us some standards, to give us some, some posts to kind of stand on and go, okay, we know to what we're marching towards. We know the North Star in this case of the AI trustworthiness. That's still lacking. So to your point, great capability. Everybody jumped on. Everybody's trying to get it to solve certain problems. Um, and everybody has been focused on accuracy and, and those kind of aspects of AI to truly try and solve the problems. But everything else has been has been lacking for for you know all, all, all the obvious reasons. Right? So kind of how do you so how do you do it? Or how do you how do you kind of get to this? I think first we have to recognize that these variations are going to exist, and it's important to recognize them up front, right? You know, a solution that may be applicable to a U.S. population, right? Let's say let's say we're talking about healthcare. But healthcare over here is, is not exactly the same as healthcare in other countries. Right? There are many factors, right? So the first step is truly to recognize their differences. Um, but there are some commonalities. There are some aspects of, you know, what you can kind of say you call a trustworthy AI that are that really should be kind of held in common across all of this. So if you look at, like, most popular literature these days, and all of this is still mostly in the academic um, area, and it's slowly getting more into, you know, crafting of regulations across, for example, countries like EU and UK. Um, the US is catching up. We're having some strong pushes to have some regulations around AI. They're roughly around between three to 
eight or more of these dimensions that you can think about trustworthy as an AI. I always start from the from the top and kind of try to say that, you know, when we think about artificial intelligence and how do we determine the trustworthiness, at a minimum, we have to look at it from three angles, mm-hmm. ethical, technical, and the legal standpoint. Without those three, you're not going to have, you know, trustworthy AI. And, you know, two out of three does not satisfy. You have right. to have all three components. And then that kind of expands more into these capabilities, right? You know, questions around are we able to understand and explain exactly what decisions are being made, right? That dimension is typically referred to as explainability of the artificial intelligence. So being able to explain what is going on at different levels, right? Because somebody who is not an AI expert still has to understand what's going on so they can make decisions based on the recommendations, right? Um, There's a dimension of fairness. Are we properly monitoring and safeguarding everything, right? Are these solutions and recommendations truly fair um, when it comes to their recommendations? And we'll probably get into some examples later on, right? Yeah. Um, the next one is is more around the robustness of the solution. And so as we, as we scale these solutions, you know, it's okay to have a solution that solves like a small problem, you know, and, and, and a small scale, let's say in a county or something like that. But when you start to scale this to you know, regions and countries and maybe globally, does that solution truly scale? This touches a little bit of your topic of, does it applicable all around? And where it is and right. where it isn't, how do we understand, right? Um, then there's a question around transparency and, and, you know, does everybody that is involved at all the levels clearly have this ability to what's going on with these solutions and what they're recommending, very tied to, to explainability we talked about earlier. And then finally, kind of the concept of privacy. Right? Like mm-hmm. how, are we, how are we dealing with our, with the data that is being collected and how does that data live through the life cycle and what happens with the artificial intelligence solution recommendations, right? So those are kind of the five core dimensions that, that everybody talks about. There's some variations on it. Um, and, uh, you know, within that, you can kind of start to paint a picture of, okay, at least if nothing, at least we have these five things that we should be trying to strive towards. The next level down is like, well, what questions do we really ask about those, and how do we how do we truly make that you know work? When, when you think about uh, this first part, this is explainability, maybe we can break that down a little bit because it it seems instrumental to making decisions around these programs, whether they're released to a small set of data, a large set of data, like you said, expanded out yeah. to a much bigger scale. Yeah. Because, right. and correct me where I'm wrong here, as I understand it, AI is programs are very good at accomplishing tasks set for them for like a desired outcome. So the example of, I forget the name of the AI that discovered Hallison, the antibiotic. So mm-hmm. it was able mm-hmm. to scan through 2000 different molecules, see things in ways that humans actually hadn't even considered possible to view them. So in a way it's okay. viewing our reality inputs different than we are. And to come out of that with a new antibiotic that would have taken, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of hours for a human to arrive at, yet we don't know how it did it. And this creates a conflict of interest for humans, especially in this example, like you said, within the confines of healthcare, because that's a good thing. If you're yeah. anybody, whether you've heard of, of AI or not, or, or you think that AI is just the Terminator movies, hearing that an antibiotic has been discovered that's going to help people save lives and can now be administered uh, with a, you know certainty that it's effective, it could be very easy to overlook this explainability part and just go, hey, we got exactly what we were looking for. We discovered Correct. something new. It's going to help people. We're not entirely sure how, it, how this uh, machine arrived at that. To you, how crucial is that part? Is is f- working backwards and figuring out the explainability of getting to those end results, whether they are positive or negative. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crucial, right? It's really, and it's hard to put like weight on any of these dimensions, like all of them are important. But I think if we, if we tie back to my earlier comment about human beings and being able to determine trustworthiness um, of another human being, right? 
that 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 is a component that I think we, we we critically need the explainability portion of it. Otherwise, we're kind of looking at a black box. We get some inputs, and then we get some outputs, and we cross our fingers and say, "We well, I hope somebody kind of thought about it." Right? And in some cases, it, it is okay. Like you you've never probably even thought twice if you asked Google Maps or, or Siri to give you a recommendation how to get from never. point A to point B. You never thought about well, is that right? Right. But right. also, what is the worst case scenario? Like if you're in a city. Okay, fine. The road is maybe closed, but right. if you're somewhere in a rural, <laughs> like rural area, and if the road doesn't exist anymore, but that's somehow not updated, and you're routed down that path, and it's hundred and something degrees outside, and you're now running right. out of water, like now you're starting to run into real issue that can potentially you, know, you can potentially kind of die, right? right. Uh, but still, in, in those scenarios, like we don't really kind of think about it. Like we're just using it, and it's going forward. Um, but there are scenarios in which. Um, we, we really have to be very careful about it and where explainability is critical. And it's, in my opinion, it's not as hard as it seems. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. It is hard, but there are steps that could be taken to get us closer. And I'll give you an example. So in 2019, there's been, there's been, there's been some work that was done um, um, with a company called Optum. Optum uh, provides a lot of services to health, um, um, health uh, insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And um, they had an artificial intelligence system that was working with a lot of different providers, so hospitals, big systems. And the system, their, their solution was really working on recommending procedures for the patients. Right? So you can imagine, mm -hmm. right, any hospital has a lot of data, right, about, about patients. Um, so, like, wouldn't it be great if we could help doctors, but to your point, see something that maybe is not immediately visible, right, right? And, and surface potential recommendations for particular um, uh, treatments, right? Wonderful. I mean, great news, right? Save the doctor's time, save the, the lives of patients. I mean, right. everybody wins. Well, after some investigation, some time of using it, it turned out that these recommendations were disproportionately being given to certain group of patients and not given to another group of patients, which at the highest level, really, there was no reason for not to give the same recommendation. I mean, if you look at the, at the, at the you know, the, the, the medical kind of treatments and things like that, they probably should have been recommended the same thing. There's some studies done looking into what is actually going on. And one of the things that were discovered was that one of the features out of thousands of features probably that are used in a model to predict who should be given what, was cost of care. And cost of care was used as a proxy for needs. Meaning so the now, higher the cost of the procedure, the more that it was desired. Who was spending, yeah, the, the patients that were spending money on a particular procedure, right? Right. So inadvertently, what happened is that the bias was kind of immediately built through that one feature in the system. And of course, naturally, what actually happened over time is the system started to predict or recommend treatments to similar type of population that was spending money. It turns out that disadvantaged population was not spending money because they didn't have money, right? But so now we suddenly see this disparity being propagated in the in this in this you know algorithm, completely un unintentional. Nobody sat there and went, "Well, we're going to focus on you know." white folks versus these folks, right? right. No, it was an unintentional, but the bias existed in the data and the way it was used. Explainability component would have been really around understanding critical features and being transparent about these features that are being used and how they're being used so that on the receiving end, when you're looking at recommendations, you're starting to understand, um, you know, what, what is going on. And probably if, you know, if, if enough time was, was given and enough look was given at this, this would be detected collaterally and potentially fixed. Right. Or it will be clear that there isn't enough data, let's say, for another type of population, or these features do not work well in this type of population. Therefore, the explainability component could be Mr. Doctor or Mrs. Doctor, just so you know, this type of recommendation works best for these types of profiles. Now we're starting to get to uncovering a little bit of what's going underneath and you start right. to build trust between, in this case, the doctor and, and, and the system, right? So it that's... seems like in that, in that setting, the onus on the human to be ethical is very weighted. Like you really, <laughs> you have to have a pretty thorough amount of homework performed to establish I guess the ideal type of person 
to help mm -hmm. govern these types of things, right? Yeah. Because any type of, you know, let, let's say in that situation, someone notices that and they, and they purposely look the other way, right? So how do you control for individual ethics as programs are rolled out? And, and is that even something that you consider even at trust vector or just as a, as a big problem, how do you vet the individuals that will then work on fairness, transparency, explainability without bringing their own bias, which almost seems impossible because everyone has biases from their life that just, they exist, right? There's various degrees on that spectrum of how intense they are and, and where they yeah. fall politically. But that seems like a really hard thing to figure out on the human side of the equation. It is, it is. And, and you're right about biases, right? Like, you know, I could ask you, you like vanilla or chocolate. Right. And whichever way you gave me the answer, you're biased one right. way or another, right? <laughs> so, and that's, like you said, it's normal. Right? We, we have that, we have that kind of, um, we're influenced by a lot of, a lot of things when it comes to bias, right? Like, you know, and I, I, I for example, first learned about the word bias, if you, if you will, like in, in high school, um, you know, after coming from Europe, moving to Canada, and, you know, they were giving us these talks about bias, bias in media. And I, I didn't know the word in English is my, my second language. And right. uh, I said, well, what does this mean? You know, but they gave us a really good example of like, um, um, you know, I don't know when, sometimes in the 70s, 80s, I don't know, some airliner was shot down um, by, you know, some, some, some jet right uh, in somewhere in Europe or in, in Korea, I don't remember. And it was portrayed as in terrorist act, defensive action, blah, 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 blah. But then a few years later, the same thing happened just on the opposite side. And that the same idea, but it was portrayed as complete accident. Of course, nobody wanted blah, 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 blah. And when they gave me that example, I was like, oh, yeah, I know what bias is, right? We're influenced by everything that happens around us, media and, and our decisions and our upbringing and everything else. Here. So how do you control for that, right? Um, I, I, I truly I truly want to believe that, you know, nobody would want to do any harm. Um, right. Now that's not the case, right? It, it right. will happen. Every <laughs> I also while, want but, to believe that. <laughs> right, we, we really want to believe that, right? We really want to believe that. Um, you know, a lot of examples that, that I've been looking at, that we've been studying and, and looking through and talking through, you know, folks that, that, that work with us, whether that's in, you know, um, higher education and, and, um, and, you know, selecting folks for enrollment um, and, and kind of trying to determine the risk, whether they're going to stay or, or leave, you know, mm -hmm. um, their biases in that, whether it's lending their biases around lending, uh, whether that's, uh, you know, insurance, you know, legal, that there, there are many kind of components, right? But it seems that every time an issue currently is coming up, it's coming up as the the, the unintended consequence of something that has been looked at, right? right. So let's take a stand for, for a moment that, you know, it, it really is unintended. I think that the, 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 the solution doesn't, doesn't change about what I'm going to say, whether somebody intended or didn't intend. So my perspective, or our perspective, at least from Trust Vector, and I, I feel that that's really supported by a lot of things that are happening in, in the grander community that is focusing on responsible AI and trust for AI and governments around the world. You know, the first step really in this is, is education. There's a lot of education that needs to happen. And by that, I don't mean, you know, give a data engineer an ethics class. class. Right. I had ethics classes and all of my friends that were, you know, software developers that, you know, we had ethics classes, but that's not enough. Ethics is, is one component of the class, but education component, kind of these type of discussion that you and I have, so they can understand from all of these examples, how some completely innocuous, inaccurate decision, something small to them, that's an example of often that we just talked about, right? When they chose, you know, the cost of care is one of the key features, right? Uh, I would assume the problem data simply wasn't that good. They had to, they had to get something. And they said, yeah, this is probably representative, right? And nobody would really sit there and went, well, yeah, we're going to do it this way for you know, some, some, some bad reason. Um, but the education of these examples, so that they know to at least to recognize and, and start to ask some questions around this. The second piece is that, as you saw, that those dimensions, because it's a kind of three-legged stool of technology, ethics, and, and, and legal, there isn't really one person that can understand all of this. Right. I mean, if you're really going to be an expert, you're not going to understand all the components. So that multidisciplinary view is really needed. And then the third piece is that 
you really shouldn't um, like any kind of governance, you know, whether we look at financial financials, right? Like we, we don't let financial companies that are part of SEC audit themselves. They right. have an auditors that come in, right? And they look independently. And even then there are some issues, right? Right. Um, we're trending in the same direction. We're trending in, in, the, in the direction of really being able to have independent third parties that are able to get in with these multidisciplinary views um, and help companies, whether those companies are creating or using AI or whether you're investing or you're regulating AI, to really look, as I like to say, look under the hood in real detail across the all three components, across all three dimensions, and help surface issues, help ask questions that you know the other two groups wouldn't, right? An ethical person that focuses on ethics, they really know the questions to ask from the ethical standpoint that others have not even considered, right? Similar from the technology standpoint, similar from the legal standpoint. So I, th I think it's a little bit of a mix of that, you know, education um, combined with the right, right, right frameworks, whether that's organizational or governance frameworks, and then services on top of that, such as the audits um, that are independent. And I, I emphasize independent because I think we've, we're seeing big organizations, they, they have the funding to actually have ethicists and uh, statisticians and everybody else in their teams. And they can form the, the ethics committees. Well, we still see issues come up. Like we saw issues with Facebook, for example, right? right that, that were coming up. So, and, and again, we're, I'm not going to get in detail why and how, but I do truly believe that independent look um, carries a lot of weight, um, right. especially once the standards come out, once we know kind of what we're kind of going against. Well, you say on on the website uh, for TrustFestor, it, it says less than 20% of executives strongly agree that their organization's practices and actions on AI ethics match their stated principles and values, which... That found, to me, that seemed really surprising. That is a, an extremely small number of people at, at high level decision making positions that are, if I'm understanding that statistic right, really aren't recognizing what's in front of them with, yeah. with artificial intelligence, the decision making power, and, and to everything that we just spoke about, how important it is to have staff and individuals, yes, on a company level, but then also on this governance kind of oversight body level. Yeah. What about that statistic kind of lights you up or, or gives yeah, you purpose I, I, to <laughs> fix that? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is, this is actually a recent study that was done by, by um, IBM. They, they, did, they did a big survey and they did it, I think, three years ago as well and did some comparisons, right? And uh, I, I, I had a jarring moment as well when I saw that the 20%, right, uh, that strongly agree um, that their organization's practice and, um, and, and actions on AI ethics that match or exceed their kind of stated principles. Um, but then... Then I started thinking, because I looked at other components of this, right? So this is the component of like, does somebody agree or doesn't agree that their organizations kind of match their values? And, and right. um, yes, there seems to be still a way to go, with, you know, with that, with that perspective. But when you compare, for example, some other metrics that are related to what happened about three years ago, I think we're trending in the right direction. So let me, let me kind of share with you what, I, what I'm thinking about. The same study was done about three years ago. And, and when you look at individual kind of roles within an organization that truly took the accountability for mm -hmm. trustworthy AI, all of those roles were on the technical side of the spectrum. Chief data officers, chief information right. officers, data scientists weren't even on the list, by the way, uh, three years ago. That tells you how much, you know, from the ethics standpoint, they could focus on. Not so surprising. Again, if you, if you, I think, think about my earlier comment, everybody's trying to solve the problem and be accurate with their solution. You know, and, and, and you know, they they're not really thinking at that time, at least, about other things. Three years later, there's a shift. There's a shift where now I think it's like eighty percent shift. Where now there's a shift towards the non-technical executives that are taking the accountability chief um, uh, executive officers, um, there is the, the compliance officers, the legal teams, like others are getting involved. And that's a really, really, really good thing, in my opinion. Yes. Because just like the, the need for a multidimensional perspective to solve trustworthiness and determine it, from the organizational leadership standpoint, you need to have that, 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 that 
um, palette of, of, of right. resources and, and folks that are focusing on it. It can't be just technical folks. It has to be everyone. And my, 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 my strong belief is that that the 20 percent that you see when it comes whether somebody believes that the organizations are, are are kind of matching their principles from the ethical that that's going to start to change because when you have this large group involved and everybody's looking at it you're starting to get traction and you're starting to again to see results that start to match somebody's expectations of where the ai trustworthiness or like ethics are supposed to be and then there's the second metric that kind of comes into all of this i think that one of the other metrics that are mentioned over there is that something like um you may, I may have to look it up. I don't know. I think it's 75%. Yeah, 75% of executives view ethics as a source of competitive dis, uh, uh, differentiation. And in the business world, that's really important because they're starting to realize that if the solutions that are coming out and are being used are ethical or are trustworthy, because again, it's a competitive ethics, advantage for them. It is a competitive advantage, yeah. exactly. If I can have a solution that is truly there, I can truly now differentiate, not right. only on my accuracy and everything else, but I can I can differentiate from everybody else and try and help help my, my clients kind of you know get the right right results and ultimately not have the, the you know unintended outcomes. So, so that, I think when you that combine those I think it's good. Is very uplifting. I mean that's positive, right? That that feels pretty yeah. good that there's a wave of people on the non-technical side in leadership positions starting to recognize artificial intelligence as integral to their business model, but also that skewing on the, onto the ethical side of that spectrum is going to be good for business, which in a capitalist society, if it's not good for business, it's not going to be looked at. Are there anything or are there statistics maybe that scare you? Uh, are there statistics that, that scare me? Um, I don't know about statistics necessarily that, that scare me, but you know, statistics are statistics. This is across industries. I think if you started to split this by individual industries, you know, some industries are further along than others. Right. And I think that in this case, industries that are traditionally, um, farther along when it comes to technology, like financial, right? Finance is always going a little bit. You know, farther along, um, and those that really should be farther along, that's the piece that scares me. And because I spend a lot of time on healthcare and, and, and you know, health industry, so that's across pharma, life sciences, you know, med device, um, you know, health insurance, and, and, and providers, I think that anywhere where we are truly impacting human lives and where you, we are lagging, um, that's the piece that scares me a little bit. And healthcare in general has been technologically lagging behind other industries and we don't have we don't have the luxury to do that now if we're using these systems to make decisions right, right. that's the piece of, i don't know the statistic around and i unfortunately don't have a split between industries but that's the kind of thing that that really kind of scares me a little bit of of how fast can we move with regulations and standards um so that we can we can actually make an impact which also is part of the reason why actually I created Trust Factor, to be honest with you, because I was getting frustrated as I was reading these results of, of, of these issues that are coming up. And I had two choices. I could sit and wait for standards to come up, regulations to be created, and then say, okay, well, let's create something around it. Or we kind of think about what we have, which is enough to get things moving and start moving in the right direction. And I felt that we don't have the luxury as a, as a society to sit, wait for somebody in some government to pass some law. You know what I mean? Definitely um, not. Honestly. Yeah, right. definitely honestly. not. And especially um, at the, the rate at which computing power improves and the rate at which AI one rolls out, but how I feel like we're always so close to it. the improvements are so vast and it yeah. happens and maybe artificial intelligence has had peaks and valleys of progress over the past 50 years, but the rise from a valley to a peak is extremely fast when it does happen. Okay. And you don't know how, how close are you to the verge of the next light speed forward in something, whether that's in healthcare and finance okay. in defense. So you really do have to have an urgency around this type of thing to get these things in place while we have 
a lag in technology, right? While we're behind so that when the ball moves, we're there to play with it instead of being trying to play catch up to something that's moving at light speed. It almost seems, it surprises me frequently that this isn't discussed on a national level constantly because the implications are existential. Like we don't get a handle on any of this stuff soon from all angles that actually does pose a once in a lifetime threat to our, our existence in reality. And that's not to say that it's just going to the Terminator things going to happen, right? That's not where I'm going with this at all. I think that that's very fictitious, but the ability for these programs and, and machines to move faster than we can rope them in isn't out of this world of possibility. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it, it's already happening. Like we, we just highlighted one or two examples, right, of issues. There are many other examples that are happening that that you know we may not be not be even aware of. Um, so you know, it, it, the good news in all of this is that it, it is starting to be talked at the national level. Um, there are there are you know the White House is looking at it. The uh, Department of Commerce has put together um, the, uh, the AI type of a task force, mm-hmm. um, and they're they're really looking at it. And one of the big components of it is is the trustworthiness. I mean, AI is very important to the, to to us as, as a nation, not just from a security standpoint, but from from all around you know kind of standpoint. And while we still claim that as a nation we are kind of the leaders in AI, I think that there are there are other countries that are doing really well, namely yeah. China, and yeah. moving really fast, you know, at, at, at a very fast clip, right? So it's recognized. Um, it's definitely being talked at, but uh, to your point, probably not as as much as it needs to be. Um, and my sense is that it's going to start to pick up speed. And if we just follow kind of what's happening in other countries, you know, European Union and, and other places, there is more of that rise of, you know, the academics that are looking at this, we'll get more into the, into the regulatory and government kind of space and trying to put um, act, you know, the, 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 the um, uh, rules and, and, and rights in, in place. Um, Canada just released uh, their AI Act uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I believe. Um, so, you know, a lot of a lot of good movements are happening in those governments. And I think that once we see see a little bit more movement, there's going to be it's just going to be kind of small snowball effect. I think I think we're going to get there. I think we're on the right trajectory, to be honest with you, not to try to paint everything in, in, right. in good colors. <laughs> yeah. But if you compare it to three years ago, um, I, I think we're we're really getting uh, you know there's there's an attention to this and there's an attention from not just big corporations but from small organizations and and even startups as you can see right that are looking at as going man this is a really important problem that we have to try and and, and solve um, that we have to to kind of get ahead of because if we don't it, it's just going to run us over then you know we're going to become the unintended consequence you know <laughs> right. that would not be good what what challenges do you hear within your line of work from businesses that you work with or, or people that come to you for guidance, like what kind of things are arising where they're, they're recognizing that this trust idea is going to be something that's very important as we start to roll these things out into more of a public sphere and out of the testing zone. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think what, what, what keeps coming up, um, there, I'll probably say two, two kind of critical things. There's a recognition um, as people start thinking about this, to our earlier point of not just the complexity of the of the problem, but the complexity of the personnel that you need or the types of views that you need to solve this. So there's 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 a recognition now for most people that I talk to that you know they can't just hire one guy or one girl and and and, and get this sorted out, and that it's not just a data scientist. So there's that recognition. So that that's good, but there is a challenge that everybody is kind of facing with. You know, to do the AI, you need a lot of data. When you have a lot of data, you need to understand really what's in there and figure out how to use it. And there there are a lot of challenges around really using the right data for the right purpose um, and kind of at 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 the right time. Um, and that, you know, I mean, Chris, Chris probably talked a lot more around, around data aspects of it, right? And, um, but the, the, it is challenging because we rely on that data to produce recommendations, yet we have to be very careful about all the biases potentially that are built in over the years of data that is being collected. So I'm still hearing a lot um, 
from the perspective of that, you know, how do we truly look at our data? What what's missing, or what do we have in there that we shouldn't be having, that we shouldn't be including? Um, and then the aspects of well, now from the outside of the technical standpoint, uh, you know, what what else is needed? You know, one thing that I find very surprising coming from the technology and science background and, and spend spending years doing digital transformations um, and, and, you know, leading large scale kind of, you know, changes. One thing that I, I'm a little bit surprised when I look at is some of these organizations that do provide artificial intelligence solutions, um, maybe they're on a smaller scale compared to the big ones. There's lack of kind of standard procedures and standard documentations and standard you know, everything that governs any kind of software development solution, right? I'm finding that to be less less available, less easily um, findable. And most things are kind of just being done. Everybody's still kind of operating, or not everybody, but at least folks that I'm seeing are operating more in this lab type of environment where you're experimenting and then the sun comes up and then you change it and some which is okay. But once we're in production and once right. the recommendations are being made, <laughs> You have to fall back to standard procedures and practices that are that are regardless of what system you have have to be followed. Right? Can um, you can elaborate to... a, a little bit on what some of those standards might be? Maybe choose an industry that you're thinking of and and talk a little bit about yeah what yeah what a good standard is, how you yeah. roll that out and how you maintain it. Yeah, I think you know the first thing that comes to mind is around like, like any any. AI solution, right, as you're kind of designing it and then, and then building it and testing, testing it, there's a set of documents that everybody has to kind of keep track of um, and, and and keep in mind and keep updated at all times from design all the way through testing and, and everything else. So there's clarity as to not only what was asked, but how it was designed and how it is evolving, right? right. What I'm finding is that that that, that rigor of, of making sure that proper documentation is in place, um, that is lacking a little bit with some of these some of these solutions I'm finding. Again, probably in bigger organizations, maybe maybe not so much. But I don't know. I, 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 I would ask, I would right. maybe question that when I when I talk to them as well, right? So from I, I kind of look at kind of how we look at things, and when we talk to companies trying to help them, you know, that that is a critical component of being able to truly truly have the robust documentation that goes in line with this, with along with everything else, such as you know. If you are if you are truly having things that are being tested, you gotta have different environments. These are basic things, yes. right? That you do testing in and then you deploy. Uh, but you know, I've, I've seen situations where you know companies would would you know not to do that, and you know the answers were well, you know, the model changes, so the model changed, and you know it's you know we're, we're just changing and we're putting production. Well, all of that is fine, but you gotta have a way to roll it back. You gotta have a way to understand who can intercept decisions. You gotta have a way to kind of have all the documented. So if anything happens, we know who needs to take action, so on and so forth. All of that exists in somebody's head usually, right? right. There's less structure around putting that on, on 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 paper, and I emphasize that because it, to me it's, it's a critical component of of getting to to a place where you can trust a, a solution, having things properly documented and taken care of. Does it take time? Yes, it does, but it always did. Right. <laughs> Every solution well, plus that everybody did. Right? There's a benefit there too with as these positions that you're talking about, um, you know, like a, a head of data ethics or something like that that continue to roll out in companies. With more jobs like that, you're going to have turnover. And so you're going to have people Correct. leave. And when someone leaves, they can't leave with all the standards in their head. They need to leave and go somewhere else. And whoever steps in needs to be able to understand and read and basically pick up exactly where the previous person left off so that, again, there's you're minimizing the risk that at any point it gets away from you because the mm -hmm. speed at which it can run is incomprehensible to us. It is. It is. It really is. And, and, um, you know, I, I, I truly think that once the standards come out and, and once, you know, once more of this type of auditing is, is being performed, whether, you know, whether that's, you know, a third party or something like that, um, more of the structures are going to be put in place and, and more people are going to be not only willing to follow it, but be required to follow it because somebody's going to be checking. And if right. nobody's checking, then, you know, certain things don't, don't happen, right? Like, you know, I, 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 I like to have a personal trainer because, he checks on me. He makes sure right. that when I go, I actually do that. Like if I was just left to my own to go and like lift weights in a, you know, our, our gym in the, in the building, 
that probably would not happen. Right. Again, that's <laughs> me, right? You know, like I, I like my Pilates instructor because she makes sure that we do circus stuff, right? And I would never do that on my own. And I would, yeah, I could go to 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 some class maybe. No, like I know on this day I go there. So that 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 similar over here, right? When you somebody's checking on you and somebody's helping you kind of get through it, not only are you going to learn, it's going to become the part of your daily routine, but you'll have that you'll have that you know behind it that's kind of going, hey, we got to make sure that these things are happening, right? And then it's going to become more more automated and more kind of part of everybody's process, right? So, so let, those are some say... of the interesting things you know I find. Let's assume that uh, this does roll out and there are continually growing standards boards and, and control and checks and balances. In our society, there is the truth that sometimes governments operate outside the confines of things that limit powers within the public sphere. And when I think of defense, that's an area where having an upper hand is extremely valuable, right? If you are the first to develop a stealth plane, your ability to control your enemy or, or advance territory is you're not playing in the same universe anymore. And right. because of this, it seems like there is a this very scary risk around artificial intelligence and the space race that we kind of alluded to earlier between nations of getting the technology to develop behind closed doors because it's secret projects, it's projects on military defense, for example. But the the risks of artificial intelligence are the same, whether it's in healthcare or defense in terms of its ability to grow beyond the parameters. So how do we in the sector of defense instill these same values or push or lobby to have these same values because I feel like that's the area where really the, the risk is the the greatest to the public. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's an interesting topic where right? defense is very, very different beast, right. From, from the rest of them. Um, I recently spoke to somebody who is a former, um, a 10 pilot and has, mm -hmm. um, spent his career in the um in the air force um even you know at some high level commands of you know coordination of, of certain certain um war theaters um then we talked about artificial intelligence and uh, the challenge that you know the 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 art the you know military in general or defense has with with you know from his perspective trusting the the recommendations Right. right. Because, you know, from, from their perspective, and this is slightly different maybe than what you're asking, but we'll, we'll get to it. You know, from, from if, you, if you're going to put yourself in the shoes of somebody who is in the theater of war and you, you are getting recommendation from the artificial intelligence solution, you're, I don't know, general or something like that, um, you need to make a choice and you, make, you have right. to make a decision. And we know that intelligence is not always 100 percent correct, but data is data. The artificial intelligence is going to act and data is going to give a recommendation, right? Um, so it gets to that component of the human in the loop. We didn't talk too much about about human in the loop, but there's the component or, or, or the concept of making sure that ultimately there's an autonomy for a human to make a decision and intercept um, any kind of recommendation, if you will, whether that's launching a rocket or that's determining whether, you know, your, your little mole on your skin is uh, cancerous or not, right? right. There, there has to be somebody who kind of makes that decision. Right. So that, that's the first component kind of when I, when I, for example, spoke to him that we, that we chatted about that, the challenge of like, what if situation changes in the theater, right? Of, of war, like, how do you, how do you, how do you trust now the solution? Right. And there has to be that recognition that again, based on expelling and ability and transparency, the solution can act only on certain things and you have to understand what it is acting on so that you can make an educated decision to follow the recommendation right. or discard it given that something has changed. Right. Now switching over to, to the, to the ethics and preventing, you know, things from, from, from happening. Um, you know, I, I, I think that it's, it's, it goes again back a little bit to the human in the loop component where monitoring any of these actions for, you know, activities that would seem out of, out of ordinary or needs to be double checked really will still fall on the human, right? It's not going to replace that human and that human will have to make new decisions. 
what is the example that it happened in? Was it in sixties or seventies where there was a false false alarm that that uh, rockets were launched, but inter intercontinental ballistic rockets were launched, and whoever the whoever the the um, uh, the person that was responsible to pressing the button to kind of launch rockets back didn't do that because they believed that this was a false alarm, which right. turned he turned out it was right. It's no different, I think, today, right? It's just that we're kind of re relying on, on, on more aut automation, right? Um, the ethics and control piece, um, once the standards and, 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 you know, the government is kind of really, really looking at it, we're, we're going to have to have some kind of oversight um, that, that really looks and focuses on defense to be able to, to, to make sure that, you know, AI is being used um, in, in an ethical, if you will, fashion um, while still protecting the interests of the country. And that's, that's a tough one, right? Because I, because yeah. <laughs> I mean, like... you, go, you go back to the, the data set problem with the healthcare yeah. industry, right? And, and solving for price or using price as an input and then it having biased outcomes. I mean, I feel like in the military setting, in the war theater, as you referred to it, it the, the checks and balances, I mean, to solve that is such a tall task for that individual yes. to be the person that's checking the check. In the, if you're in between, let's say, the, the general and the president saying, all right, we're ready to go, AI saying, based on the data, this is the decision, knowing that that decision is going to kill a thousand people, but save 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. as an individual, as a one person, human or a group of people having to come to that conclusion of, of to authorize that, right? Because you can weigh it out a, a thousand is much less than 10,000. So the total damage inflicted is less, yeah. but then knowing that you're part of that decision process that then does this, I would imagine trauma would be one of a million different, you know, this person, that person in that setting, their life would be forever changed. Yeah. The likelihood that other people would want to sign up for that position, who knows, but that's a really tough, the, the tough dilemma to solve. It's also apparent already in the, in the self-driving car area where cars are making decisions based on the inputs that are coming at them based on risk factors, but a car might decide to do something that is the safest, but it's not what a human would do. Correct. Because you can make a decision and live with your morals. A car doesn't have morals. It's only, it's optimized to choose the safest thing to do. And sometimes that could be horrific, but yeah. statistically it's going to be doing the right thing. Correct. And that's, I mean, kind of sidetracked yeah, there, but it, it, that is a hard no, it, thing to figure out. It is. It's it's a very hard one to figure out. You know, like in the, in the military setting, I mean, the only thing I would say maybe, you know, to, to your example, I mean, I, I think military today is even, even if you're not using AI to kind of make decisions, you still have to rely on a lot of intelligence. And if intelligence yeah. is wrong, the, the, the decision that you make, where the intelligence is going to make, you know, some recommendation, you, you call, you make the call, you could still be wrong, right? So, so I think that that aspect will will remain. It could it could get amplified, sure, right? Um, or it could get better if the processing of, of, of data is better. But my my hope is at least that if you're if we just go back to the you know trustworthiness principles, and if that's included in all of the solutions that are being used in the domain of, of defense, then that hopefully you are. You're trusting the solution. The, 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 the unintended consequences are going to be minimized and, right. and hopefully no different than kind of the, the decision that you have to make today based on good or bad intelligence. Right? Like hopefully we can kind of be at that level. I mean, that's the best I can kind of think of. Right. But, but I don't know, like not, 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 not the type of things, not the type of decisions I would like to make. I always, you know, I always used to right. tell my teams, you know, <laughs> the, the work that we would do with our, you know, digital transformation and, and all of that stuff, right? you know, we're, you know, we're, we're not, you know, nobody's truly at risk of, 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 you know, you know, getting killed like in military or, or a surgeon, you know, having to make a surgery. Um, although now I'm in a different space where I'm trying to prevent that from happening, but that's a different story. <laughs> well, even to play, to play devil's advocate to my own statement, th there's on the other side of that, the ability to optimize for minimizing casualty, right? Which is magnificent. That's a, yeah. if you could take the most ugly thing in the world, which is yeah. war that causes more 
you know, trauma and lasting effects and spending than anything else and make it sounds weird, but make it cleaner. If you could use artificial intelligence to do that, I think everyone ought to want to do that. And that comes with some uncomfortable implications. There's on the, the like graph of data points over time, there's going to be some horrible data points. But if the trend is that everything gets better and there's less total casualties over time and, you know, bomb strikes aren't hitting villages instead of targets and you can minimize that certain or increase that certainty down to a very specific right. percent, that's Nobel Peace Prize worthy, right? Even in the, the, the face of destruction. Right. And even in the face of destruction. Yeah. I mean, of course. I think, unfortunately, uh, as much as I would like to believe differently, uh, we're not going to, you know, get away from not having wars. It seems. Right. Um, and um, I would so, agree with yeah, you. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, I, I think you know. I mean, you saw probably the article recently that was published. I think it was in Forbes. Um, mm-hmm. They were talking about um, oh, Wired. I think. Sorry. Um, they were talking about kind of using artificial intelligence in the training kind of environment with like VR yeah. and, and and training pilots. And so there's some some good applications. I think of it. Um, yes, it can be cost saving, um, measures, but you can also, you know, prepare in that case. I think the example was like, uh, you know, preparing pilots to, to fight against the, um, the AI, um, type of, um, you know, um, weapons and, and so on and so forth. Um, but it can, it can be used kind of in that training environment and it's probably being used um, already. So, so those are kind of good, good in a sense, applications of preparing folks to, to be most effective, right? I was their job. just reading this uh, book and they were talking about um, artificial intelligence dogfights. So they're training pilots. It, it might have been something similar. So they're yeah. training pilots yeah. to fight against artificial intelligent aircraft to do dogfight training exercises. And it quickly got to the point where the artificial intelligence won the battle. I, I mean, we're not talking people that are trying to learn how to fly planes. We're talking the most elite pilots in the world. Yeah. Yeah. You can't even hold a candle because, and I thought as a, as someone who doesn't work in this field and just finds this stuff fascinating, the plane would do things that are allowed by physics, but wouldn't be done because a human wouldn't take the risk of doing it because the AI mm-hmm. could, would knew with certainty that it would be able to pull off whatever the maneuver was. And you actually saw this also when AlphaGo beat the best chess players in the world because yeah. it would do things that were atypical of a good chess player. Like good right. chess players learn to not sacrifice the queen, right? That's yeah. your most mobile piece on the table. So why would you get rid of it? Whereas alpha go will very readily sacrifice it if it knows that it can make other moves to do it. So you get again, this idea that artificial intelligence is seeing our it's seeing reality through a lens that we can't view it through and it sees decisions and physics and risks differently because it's it's not taking into account this human element which we're finding limits us yeah no i mean there's there's no doubt about it that it can process a lot of information much faster than we can and recognize patterns much better than 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 we probably can and that's the trick right it can it can really do things fast it can consume a lot of data and then recognize patterns. And then in this case, right, fight against those patterns based on some risk scores, right, Right. to avoid what we would normally typically do based on training or based on whatever else is necessary, right. Um, And I think that like the number of iterations it took, I don't remember exactly from that article, but it was a small number of iterations it took AI to become better. I want to say the number was twenty, but I, I with uh, the with the AI for the pilots, yeah, yeah, uh, to be able to 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 be the pilots. It was some uh, really small number of iterations, like you know, like, I think it was twenty, but nonetheless, that of its so learning, cool. it's crazy. I mean, right? You think of an elite pilot, right? If you really unpack it, again, so many of these statistics and this information, it's so surprising. But it's surprising on the surface when you really unpack it. It's it's out of this world. You mm-hmm. take a pilot. And you think of all the different filters that they've made it through to get to where they are, to the point where the military is going, we're going to give you a $30 million piece of equipment, and we trust that you're going to do a good job with it. Correct. 
pilot school, their IQ is extremely high. Their physical abilities are crazy. They can withstand G-forces that other pilots wouldn't have been able to, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And in 20 attempts, this thing that didn't even know what it was, you know, like was birthed into the equation of trying to figure this out, does it in 20 attempts. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, right? So... I don't know. We're going to see as far as defense <laughs> is concerned where we're going to go. Uh, but I do have to say this, though. Like, for example, it, we, you know, we've spent a lot of time looking at different um, um, different frameworks um, yeah. that, that exist out there um, and, you know, figuring out what is the best way to kind of structure our framework when it comes to analyzing things. You know, the Department of Defense does does a really good job when it comes to, to looking at trustworthiness and, and kind of thinking through what is necessary, what questions need to be asked. And they do this for themselves because they have to evaluate solutions that they're buying, right? right. So they've, they've done a they've done, you know, really, really comprehensive job around kind of looking at this. Not that others haven't. Others have done a pretty good job too, but it just since we're talking about defense, it just kind of uh, you know, occurred to me that you know, they, they, they're definitely looking at and thinking about uh, trustworthiness, right? Um, so, Well, the trust trustworthiness in and of itself is an interesting topic because... We already trust it. That's what's so interesting on a, on a consumer mm-hmm. level, at least, right? Right. The you use the example of Google Maps earlier. I think it's a, a great example, right? Because everyone's probably used Google Maps or Waze or something Waze, in the yeah. past. When was the last time that you got in a car, put in Maps, and then also grabbed the Atlas and said, "You know, I'm just going to make sure that that that's the right place I'm going," or Instead, what happens is in real time, it makes mistakes in front of your face and you see it and it fixes it and you go, oh, okay. And you just trust it. It's this interesting thing where we already, for those that do think about AI, don't think about AI, we already have a positive relationship with artificial intelligence and we readily consume it across all spectrums from computing to using our phone or trying to decide where to go on a trip, right? You look up a uh, best place to go in May and you just trust that it's done more research than you have. And you make decisions about your life and what you're going to do because of that. We already are, are there. Do you Sorry. see w- because of that, because we already have this kind of inherent trust with it, that it's challenging to convey the benefits and the necessity of establishing more of a rigor around this? So, um, I, you know, I haven't looked at it from that, from that point of view. I mean, you bring, you bring a good point of view that we definitely trust it in a lot of kind of applications, but I think we also, um, so I, I guess my answer would be, would be no. And, and, and here is why we've have, we have enough examples of issues that have come up that have become now known in the mainstream and that people are becoming aware of and are starting to think whether in certain situations they can trust the recommendations of an artificial intelligence or not. The examples you and I kind of just talked about around Google Maps and stuff like that, nobody even thinks about whether that's, that's artificial intelligence or not, and it's part of our daily lives. And it can't necessarily kill you in most cases, as we said. Right. But in the situations, <laughs> right? Kind of do a wall. Right, yeah. Well, if you if you drive downtown right. Chicago for many many yeah, years, there you like, go. <laughs> it would, like it, it would show you that you're driving in the in the river, actually, not you know, not you know, on on the road that is parallel yeah. to the river. I think right. that's fixed. I don't know, right? yeah. but nonetheless, like you know, maybe other issues than yeah. just AI, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, so, so those are the things that that are like you said, they're commercially available, and we kind of rely on them, and we we don't even we don't even think twice about it, and we probably hopefully shouldn't, and you know, all of that is fine. But I think that people are starting to become aware of the issues that are truly starting, they, 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 that always mattered to them. They just didn't realize that issues would, would come up, right? Um, and, and there's more now publicity around the fact that there there are issues and thinking around why there are issues. So I, I don't find, like when I when I talk to people, even if they're, even if they're not like focused on artificial intelligence, it's enough to give a couple of these examples, whether that's, you know, discrimination in healthcare, whether that's discrimination in, in um, higher education and, um, or like, you know, getting a job. Those are the things 
that people suddenly start to realize, wait, that could be me, but right. I have no idea. You have absolutely no idea and no way to tell whether, let's say, let's say you're applying for a job. You really don't know whether an HR company or, or company that like looks through your, through your, through your resumes, you have no idea whether they're using artificial intelligence to, to filter through or not. Right. right? And, and is that good or bad? Well, I mean, it depends, but it depends if you get discarded for some reason that actually is discriminatory, right? right? Whether that's where you went to school or that's, I don't know, you know, what, whatever the reason is what you post in Facebook. I don't know. Like it, it could be different reasons. Right. Um, so suddenly, you know, when you give people those kind of examples, they go, wait a minute, this is an everyday thing. I could be applying for a job anytime. I could be applying for a loan anytime. I could be trying to get my kids into, into high school, into uh, university. And it starts to go, whoa, like just like Siri or just like Google Maps, I would not think that this would be impacted. Right. But now it's starting to come up to the surface, similar to the self-driving cars. The issues, like we would never even think about self-driving cars if we didn't have all the issues, right? If, if mm -hmm. somebody, you know, unfortunately, or people didn't have, didn't die because of some of the some of the decisions that they were made, right? And I think that's what kind of floats up to the surface are those 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 issues that truly impact us, um, you know, our lives in one way or another. But there are other issues that we're not necessarily aware of that are not being written about, right? I mean, AI could could easily so education system is an interesting one education the issue with 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 um, um, using artificial intelligence to determine the risk of somebody getting into the school and then you know staying in the school right because you're trying to maximize tuition like for right? admission get, right for admission yeah. right exactly so there, there were there were some studies and I think I posted recently on LinkedIn on that as well you can see it over there um, and uh, um, there are some investigations that are being done into some of these software that are being used because they're using some risk scores for the admissions that discriminate against people that are going to schools that are either poor or in, in you know disadvantaged neighborhoods. So okay, so discrimination, fine, right? I mean, it's it's not good. It has to be tackled. No question about it. But there's a flip side to this whole thing. It turns out that those folks that actually were not, for example, accepted, but could have been, but they were dis you know they were discriminated against, they were more likely to stay longer in the college if they were accepted compared to some others that were accepted but actually dropped out. Huh. So now you, you're kind of getting hit from both sides. Not only are you doing something that is wrong and you're discriminating, right. but now you're actually you losing revenue from the business standpoint mm -hmm. where you could actually be getting you know normal tuition and at the end of it all actually have a, somebody who stays longer and actually graduates and now we're advancing to society. Nobody really writes too much about that other aspect. Right, but it's right. there. Like it's it's really it's it's, it's tied. You well, can't and this say is that where morals and ethics again become so crucial because there's an opportunity, right, where capitalism can override cultural values and equality. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But you, <laughs> I mean, the complexity to these issues is so deep. I. I was thinking too about discrimination and equality specifically are very challenging things to tackle because artificial intelligence runs off first assessing data sets, right? Mm -hmm. And then through the data set assessment, it can use whatever parameters to produce an outcome or, or decide something or recommend or choose, accept, decline, admit, turn away. And, I, if you look at something like, let's say you were going to use it and one of the inputs was marriage. And so you look at marriages across the United States, you're going to see a disproportionate number of heterosexual marriages to homosexual marriages, right? Because some states don't allow it. It's newer, newly allowed in other states. So if it's just assessing that, it could, for example, classify abnormal and normal as homosexual marriages being abnormal and marriages from heterosexual couples being normal. Right. That is a vast error ethically okay. if this is then going to advance and make decisions. Decision, correct. But <laughs> if you ask of an evangelical Christian about that data set, that's, that makes total sense to them, right? Again, this it creates complexity in assessing 
decisions that impact culture and society. How, and how, how do you move that needle forward? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it, and, and it's very tough, right? But you have to look at the purpose of the problem you're trying to solve and the purpose of that data and the right data to be used to make that decision, right? I think, I think that's where it really kind of comes down to. There's an element of us as a society not getting deep enough into problems to, to really want to understand what we need to understand. Higher education is a perfect example. Like if you look, look at that that study that was published, um, they say that most higher education you know places don't actually know what is 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 being done to make the recommendation who is to be admitted or not. It's outsourced to a third party who develops the software, develops develops some criteria, and they spit out the results. Mm -hmm. You have to be intellectually curious, but if you're in those roles, but you have to be you know, that squared, basically, like you, you have to, you have to really understand deeply how this solution, whether you create it or you're buying it, I don't care, is making a decision and what it is using to make that decision, right? If nothing else, to feel that that decision is the right decision. Right? You're saying the, um, the individual, let's say you work for a university and you're correct. in charge in of admissions. hiring. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Thank you, you need to have that. some you real gotta, deep curiosity as to how and why these decisions right, are being made right you have to ask right, right. you have to start to probe because if you don't then we kind of end up where we are right and so do you it, it, do you think on that token that incentives might play into this like in these positions where i i would agree with you 100 percent. I, I think the people in these positions need to have a a curiosity level to where they're listening and reading and thinking about this stuff all the time because it really does matter and it really matters in the long term. Should they be incentivized differently? Should we look to increase, you know, salaries for jobs that deal with and help make decisions around a, like AI integration and how do you start to make those positions seem desirable? One. Yeah. but then reinforce that curiosity for the individual so that you yeah. know that the person that you are getting really truly is thinking about this kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. I, um, I think that incentive in this case maybe comes in a slightly different fashion and I'll, I'll kind of explain what I'm kind of thinking about. I think that there's an element that not everybody, right. Is going to be intellectually curious and is going to ask these questions by nature. Right. Some of us will, some of us won't, and that's okay. I think that when you're looking to staff your roles, right, you got to be looking for some folks that have that intellectual curiosity. Mm -hmm. Then you, once you have them, you amplify that curiosity by providing them with the right, let's call training or, or, or ways for them to, to learn about what is important. In this case, let's say, you know, how, how artificial intelligence impacts admissions giving them the right voice and a platform so they can actually voice that. And somebody who is just working in administration, who has a boss who's going to override them on anything that they say, is very quickly going to shut down. Even if they were intellectually curious, they're either not going to say anything, just going to do their job, or they're going to leave. Right. So there's this whole structure where you have to look at your organization, which is why I kind of think that this kind of gets us a little bit back to this, you know, ethics committees and independent reviews and stuff like that where if you can kind of get those types of folks to be part of a group that is truly just looking at us from the trustworthiness kind of standpoint, that gives them the way to amplify their voice and actually have a say and then have a control. It's an almost either internal independent body like that. Uh, to be, to be a part of this. Right. Mm -hmm. So as you, as you're noticing where well, I haven't even tied any incentive from the, from the financial standpoint, mm -hmm. right. There's probably some of that, but a trustworthiness to me in general, um, well, I, I guess in general, you can only incentivize people with money up to a particular point. Yes. This kind of stuff, um, first steps are to be able to give them the, find the right people and give them the platform and, and ability to actually, you know, do something and, and right. control things and voice things. That alone will, will produce values for those folks in that, in that role. Um, that can then pay dividends later on because you're uncovering issues, right? 
again, I'm not arguing that, that they have to understand every single point around data or anything like that, but they just have to ask the right question and be mm -hmm. able to find or help find somebody that can then ask even more further details, right? right. Because not, one person is not going to solve it, as we said, right? But you have to have those roles and you have to, you have to plan for those roles in all of these different kind of scenarios so that people can, can ask um, and, and be heard for those um, types of issues. When, if we, if we go back to a moment here on, on the idea of mm -hmm. trust, like to trust other people, I feel like is it's easier to do if you're a trustworthy person. And that sounds like a little bit of a, a circular discussion because it's, it's hard to know if you are or aren't, but I feel like people in those situations, being able to trust them is going to be integral right? As a screening process that these people in those positions that have that deep curiosity that are really on board for maybe some of the larger ethical reasons, making sure that you can trust their values on the front side of it to ensure yeah. that then when they go and make decisions for in the example of admissions, that they're going to do so with integrity. Now, trust is an interesting concept because I can talk to you here and, and at an hour and 15 minutes, I really do feel like I trust you. You know, if, if we were in the same city and you said, hey, let's go grab a cup of coffee at 10, I would trust that you're going to be there. And it's like you said at the beginning, it's something that inherently we can kind of pick up in the first couple of minutes or seconds of meeting someone. There's a lot of cues that we read that we don't really know that we're reading. If you lied to me, that could be devastating. And I would want to go talk to you and say, Alex, why, why did you do that? You, you violated my trust, right? Yeah. Then that's a conversation you, you and I can have, and we can work through that to decide if the relationship's worth maintaining, right? And if the violation of trust was so great that there's no coming back from it, or if it was small enough that we can get over it and, and repair that and actually go on to have a continually beneficial friendship, right? Mm -hmm you don't really get the opportunity to ask AI why it deceived you. So <laughs> how do you, with human understandings and beliefs around trust, manage that relationship as AI continues, as we said, to integrate into every aspect of our life? Yeah. So um, the first thought that came to mind when you said that how, how do you, how do you, uh, how did you put it? How do you, how do you, how do you um, tell AI Man, that it deceived you or manage that the yeah. AI has deceived you, right? <laughs> I don't think the AI has deceived you. The, the AI as a mathematical construct based on data and algorithms has executed exactly what somebody else told it to do. Even if it learned, it has kind of done exactly what somebody has I don't want to say programmed it to do because it's not an a file statement. It's based on a lot, of, a lot of other things. But essentially, somebody made a decision that this is the data we're going to use to train and this is the data we're going to use for evaluate. Somebody made a decision we're going to use these particular models and those these other models. Somebody, 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 somebody. So it's a challenge of truly looking past the black box of AI and looking at those other human beings and being able to say, how do we trust that all of them have truly, you know, put their true best interest forward so that everybody else is not deceived. And then how do we ensure that even if these two, you know, individuals did the best they could, somewhere in between when you connect the dots, things don't click properly, right? And, and, and you actually right. come up with, with some unintentional consequences, right? So I think that there's that, that we, we're not going to run away. We're not going to go away from the human component of this. And we can't, I think we have to look at a human component of that, that really built everything and, and got us into this. Right. And part of that is looking at, you know, what is documented part of that is maybe talking to, to somebody else. It doesn't take away from anything that you, you, you have said. I think your, right. your analogy and your thinking is exactly right. I think it's really, really hard. But I think one way to kind of try to think of it more is, you know, it's less of a, it's less of an object that we trust is going to execute and do something properly. It's more everything that came into that object by people that did it right. and combined it somehow, then then results in the in the. Um, but what about, 
so when AI is learning, let's say you you're putting it through a training exercise, and it's taking. Well, I mean, we'll use the chess example, right? It's taking the rules of chess that humans have established, mm -hmm. and it's running millions of games against itself to learn movements mm -hmm. and probability and patterns and and make decisions. It's doing that in private to some degree, right? You're it, yeah. you're releasing it, but it is doing the actual stuff itself on its own. Is it possible at some point that through the, uh, and I understand, I'm kind of talking myself through this as I'm saying it to you, because I can see that if you, if you took out of the parameters, you know, that it couldn't learn deception in the, the okay. learning of the data, then this wouldn't right. work. But uh, is it possible that at some point through that learning process in private, it comes across or understands deception and then some of the human benefits that deception has and has worked for us many times over, right? There's some advantages in social situations where not telling the truth doesn't get you in trouble with your parents. And so that's mm -hmm. an advantage. And maybe there's articles written about this and stuff like that, right? <laughs> Never happens uh, to me. <laughs> is, it, is it possible that artificial or general intelligence learns this concept of deception and given the hundreds of th hundreds of thousands, maybe in the future of labs that will be running this thing, internalizes that and then utilizes it. Because even if we yeah. look at, uh, I forget the name of the program, but Google has a program that can take, you know, prompts and write uh, scripts or, or, yeah, yeah. or papers, right? Uh, and in three, I think. Right. And in doing it, they said, you know, they asked it some questions and it said, you know, I am a program... I, I'm writing this because you told me to. And, and somewhere along the lines, I asked it, I think it was like, can you think on your own? And it said, no, I cannot think on my own because you didn't, you didn't write me to think on my own. <laughs> Is it possible that that happens? As an everyday citizen asking someone who actually really understands yeah. this stuff. Um, you know, I, we're, 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 I mean, at least from, from, from what I'm looking at and what I'm understanding, you know, I think we're, we're, we're still far from like, what would be considered general intelligence. I think there are a lot of a lot of components that would have to come into play. But deception alone, we are being deceived already uh, in, in certain ways with the AI. So take a look at, um, I'm trying to remember, as you were talking, I'm trying to remember um, the, the software that um, replaces faces. There's like all oh. this, like when they put like somebody's... Right, with like the deep fakes thing. So it can generate deepfake. an actual... Yeah, yeah. So deep fake, yeah. that, that is... That, that is Truly, it is actually scary really, stuff. Really good, right? But again, we have programming like deepfake functions. From my understanding, on what's called GANs, which are generative yep. advers adversarial networks, yep. and they function in the context of, you know, one generator says, "Is this Tom Cruise?" <laughs> and the and the and the on the other side, the the yep. the cop that detects the fake, if you will, yep. says, "Nope," and here's what's wrong. And then the right. generator goes, is this right? And, and it keeps on doing that until over and over. Yeah. Right. Until the, the cop and the whole thing goes, nope, that's exactly it. <laughs> Boom. So like, the, the, of course, right there, there are like cancers is a perfect, perfect example of how we could, we could deceive somebody like from our, you know, daily lives and it's getting better. I, mean, I think initial versions were not as good, but now you, you look at some of the stuff, you're like, I don't think he would ever do that, but like, it looks damn good. Like, right. It looks really close. Like, oh, I mean, imagine the the damage that someone could cause with this type of thing. I mean, of course, oh. that's that's the nihilistic, crazy, like world conspiracy viewpoint. But even on, let's say, let's say you're a, a teenager, right? And you got hormones just like charging through your body. Everything's emotional, and you get heartbroken, and you use something like this deep fake type technology to make something seem that it wasn't using someone else's face and words that they never said, uh, to the point where the human can't, we can look at some of those and you have no idea that that's fake. Right. Yeah. yeah but then no the emotions and the psychology and what will happen on the, to the person receiving it will be genuine. So they mm -hmm. can take fake information, be shown the fake information, not know that it's fake 
and then have a real human reaction to it. And maybe in some cases, that reaction is really negative. And that technology already exists. And we're, I mean, in 1980, video games were a joystick and a red button and a little mm -hmm. ping pong ball that went across the screen, right? So That's technology right. is just getting, you know, better and better yeah. and better and better. I guess that's where something like trust and what you're working on is so instrumental to the growth of this kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, it can be it can be very scary, right? What what even now can be done? Um, and um, yeah, I I, I I I truly believe we're you know not just us, but like others that are in this space, are truly trying to to do something really good, so we can at least yes. provide some visibility and understanding whether something can be trusted. There's a lot of education is going to be needed. I, I don't even know how I'm going to like explain this stuff and and what is good and not to my kids. I mean, you know, my, my, my kids are five and three. Um, and they, you know, they're going to grow up in this world, like to them, right. when the time comes, like, you know, who knows what's going to be after meta for them, like, you know, right. you know for them, it was going to be something else. I, I don't know how I'm going to explain that kind of stuff in it and, and teach them of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Um, cause you know, the rules have changed, um, and, yeah. and we're seeing issues. We're seeing some serious issues happen, right? I mean, I mean, you know, young teenagers taking, you know, taking their own lives because yeah. of bullying. I mean, I mean, horrible things that are happening. Um, and, you know, just imagine now putting on top of that something like this that can right. truly, you know, produce some pretty negative imagery or, 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 or you know, portray somebody in a, in a really negative light, light and deceive, deceive others, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's a tough problem. And I, I, <laughs> that's, I, actually, I don't know. that's an interesting, Chris yeah. and I did, we did touch on the parenting aspect and I, I, my fiance and I don't have kids yet, but we obviously, you know, we want to, I'm very excited to be a father one day and I feel like the chatter amongst age group is there are some that are really excited and just kind of follow that traditional path of getting married, having kids. But there's definitely a new perspective of maybe a little bit more nihilistic view of the world that things are crazy and it's crazier than it's ever been. And you don't want to bring kids into the world. And then there's this, I'm really excited about bringing kids into the world and looking forward to it, but there's a lot of stuff to explain that's, it's not like explaining how it used to be back in my day. It's like, it's changing by the year. It's changing by the moment. It's your kids go to school one day and they have a cell phone that flips open and can call people. And in three years later, they have a cell phone that can full on video conference anyone around the world. And they have unrestricted access to everything that's on the internet. That's a much different conversation to have in a very short amount of time. So as a parent, how do you, and as a parent, one, as a parent who works and thinks about artificial intelligence constantly, what freaks you out and is challenging about the integration of artificial intelligence? And what do you actually really look forward to and feel like is going to optimize that experience and enrich the family setting? Yeah, it's, you know, it, it's definitely scary. So being a parent is, first of all, is, is a wonderful thing. Um, and, and, you know, those that are, that are willing or, or even able, right? like, well, not, not everybody is able to be a parent, but those that are willing and that are able, um, you know, I, I think it, it definitely changes a lot of things uh, uh, about you as, as an individual. Um, and just alone, alone the responsibility of another, for another life, right? I mean, it's, right. It's, that alone is, it is important. And yes, the circumstances we live in are, um, less than optimal. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not going to get any better. I don't think, right. I think things are just going to, we're going to have to learn how to live in this, this craziness, right. Whether it's yeah. pandemics and wars and recessions and everything else, like we're going to have to kind of go through. It. Um, you know, I, I, I am, I, I am, I am worried mostly about that, that effect of, of technology, um, on, on human, like on, on children and their, and their development. Um, I am worried about, I mean, of course my kids are still too little and they, you know, our parenting is a little different. Maybe it's a little bit more traditional. You know, we, you know, we don't have a TV in the living room and Love it. they don't, they don't use iPads, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, we fail every once in a while. Yes. Yeah. They're, you know, they look at the pictures on my phone sometimes for a short period of time, but you know, we're not ideal, no doubt about it, right. but we try whatever we can to 
get them to not be entertained by technology, Fair. rather be entertained by either interacting with us, being outside, reading books. That's the kind of stuff. And of course, they're school, right? They're, they're, they care. They're, they're very entertained over there, right? So that's that's kind of what we're trying to do. Um, and I'm not worried that, you know, once they, they get their hands on the phone and they understand that they're going to be behind when needed, they're going to catch up really quickly. But I am worried to your point around what kind of effect it is going to have on them, um, especially in those vulnerable years, especially in those years when they start to become teenagers yes. and, you know, everything that comes with teenage years, right? And, you know, um, how, how, how to teach them to, to, you know, not, they can't, there's no way they're not going to be part of it. They're going to have to be part of it somehow. I mean, otherwise yeah. they're going to be complete outsiders and that's not going to work. Right. right. So there's going to be some kind of a balance that I'm going to have to find. And I don't know how I'm going to do this, but you know, my wife and I are going to have to figure out the right way to allow them things, but explain the, the consequences of it. Right. And maybe, you know, the best analogy that comes to mind right now, it, it, this just hit me by the way, as we were talking about that's what I'm here for is that, yeah. <laughs> Um, you, you just you just brought that memory. When I was a kid, um, you know, my my father was a smoker, and uh, and it was it was common in those days, right? Like you know, I grew up in the you know eighties and nineties, right? I mean, people were smokers. Um, and one thing my father told me when I was like grade six, I remember he said, "Listen, a lot of your friends are going to start smoking around this time, and I want you to know that if you ever feel that you want to try or you want to smoke." Come to me, I will give you money to buy your own cigarettes, but don't take cigarettes from anybody else. And my response was like, Ugh, look, yeah, like, I what? hate this stuff. Like, why would yeah. I even want it? What are you talking about? Right? What that did is very interesting because when I actually analyzed it later on, right, it, it did something very profound for me. Like, he did not prevent me from having cigarettes. He said, if you want it, just come to me. I will give you money. They were more afraid of, you know, drugs, let's say, right, than, than cigarettes they were. For sure. But they allowed me to have that. I've smoked half a cigarette in my entire life because I, I just wanted to know, like, one day my friends were like, <laughs> you do like, pretty what, quick. You? I'm like, guys, like, why, what is this? They're like, no, you can't have it. You don't smoke. I'm like, I just, I just want to have, I just want, I tried. I was like, Ugh. I yeah. knew it was bad. And I never smoked again, right? But the, that worked on me, right? You got to you got to know your kids, I guess, what you're going to allow them or not, right? But you inspired me to think of that because I think I'm going to have to use something very similar, where you can't, you're not going to be able to prevent them from things because the more I prevent things, the more something is going to become uh, desirable. Right. But also in this context of, of you know the the AI and, and the potential harm, uh, trying to find the right way to 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 strike that balance and and teach them early on let's say the right values, I guess, mm -hmm. right? And, and what, what makes sense and what doesn't, just like we teach them not to, I not think to that hit somebody. The, you know. Those family, the values is an important thing. I feel like in this, because you're right. It's, you can't, we're too, we're already integrated, right? I mean, yeah. every one of we got our phone right here. I got an Apple watch on, or I'm on my computer. It, the inevitability of, of integration going even further is it's present. So what can you do? And, and I think this goes, this is true for even outside of the family setting is values become very important, whether you're instilling values upon your children or you as a person decide that you're going to put some values in your life. And maybe that's, uh, just limiting the amount of time or ways in which you interact or how you interact when you interact, you know, if you're waking up at 5.30 and the very first thing you do is get on social media and start mentally downloading all this comparison and information to other people, maybe not the best thing. But if you can put structure around that or when you go on a walk, you go on a walk without your phone, little things like that, where the values, what your dad did, right? He gave you a value system. Mm -hmm. he, he, knew, he knew what would happen because he was an adult. You were going to come in contact with cigarettes and you were going to have friends who were influential over you. So he can't change that, but he can give you this value, which was oddly enough, it's trustworthiness and honesty, right? He mm -hmm. was saying that <laughs> if this comes up, you're going to have to be honest with me because you're going to have to come to me, your dad, and tell me you want to smoke cigarettes. That's a lot harder for a kid to do than to deal with the guilt of like sneaking around and then smoking a cigarette by themselves with yeah. their friends. So it put this system 
where even now as an adult, you are able to reflect on that as you said, a profound moment in your childhood. So maybe we can have, have experiences like that with our children, our friend groups and our social circles where we agree upon human values Mm -hmm. that keep us in the right mental space to integrate with AI, but not have it commandeer our lifestyle. Uh, very, very well said, right? I mean, the thing to keep in mind is with kids, especially in your examples, they watch everything. Yep. Even when you don't think that they're watching, they're watching and they're absorbing. And, um, you know, little things like how often you're on the phone, mm-hmm. his phone next to you, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. They, oh, I didn't even they think really, about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. They watch. They they know every moment you've done that you're not even aware of, right? And that that's where like it's good to have a partner who's going to keep you in check. Right, right. I'll have I'll I'll, I'll say that right now. I, I've been caught Shout many out your times, wife. Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Shout out to my wife. Absolutely. Right. She's like, um, it's like, oh yeah, you know. And does it like, does does it freak you out to think about that your grandchildren, or maybe even we go if we go a generation beyond that just to be sure, because maybe the grandchildren's conservative could be fully integrated with artificial intelligence on a, on a neural level. A like, neural I level, mean, yeah. this thing is with me 24 seven, whether I say it's with me because of work or, or whatever, if, unless I'm surfing in the water, it is not, that's the only time it's not really on my person, yeah. even passively. It's just, it's, it's with me when I'm going everywhere. Need, I got a question. Look it up on Google. Wondering where that place was. Look it up on maps. Wondering what the tip is. Do it on the couch. Like if someone came to me and said, hey, uh, for $500, we can just implant this in your wrist. You don't have to carry your phone around. That sounds really weird to me right now. I wouldn't want to yeah. do that yet. But that's we will be there. It, it will oh. happen. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that there will be some type of integration, you know, maybe two generations from now or whatever it is, um, you know, um, or I guess, yeah, or two, three or whatever. But I I think that kind of thing is going to happen. And yeah, I think I think it is absolutely weird. I mean, honestly, like probably no weirder than if you asked our grandparents, right? Like, you know, in, you know, during the second world war, if, if, if they thought first of all, that they're going to see the end of the war, but then secondly, that, you know, their grandchildren are going to be on something called phone that had right. a screen on it. They're going to communicate with them. Right. In those days, they probably had, yeah. you know, like the regular phones type of thing. Right. So there's absolutely no doubt. I think that that, 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 that type of integration is going to happen, right? Um, what I'm worried about is like, what is it going to do to uh, to to those generations as they grow up older? And like, what is it going to do to us? You just cited some examples, right? Like, you know, you calculate a tip, you have the phone, you you need to look something up, you call the phone. When I was a kid, I I, th- I think I had like 20, 20 kids in my class. I knew every single kid's home phone number. And so, that's yes. not just me. I'm not like, right. I'm not extremely right. like intelligent or anything. Like there are others that we did the same thing. We yeah. knew every kid's phone number. And nowadays, my wife's, obviously mine, right? Like right. everything else is in that, in the phone. What is that going to do to us mentally as we grow older? Right. You I mean, mean they're all like you and I, us? Just us. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, Alzheimer's and everything else. Like it, it, they're, they're already huge signs that if you don't have mental, mental, um, um, you know, athleticism, let's call it right. If you don't yeah. challenge your mind all the time, um, you know, that you're going to have a problem. So now we're going to have issues. I can't even imagine what type of issues, you know, you know generations after us are going to have when it comes to that integration and yes, making the life easier, but therefore potentially not using the brain as much or to, to its full capacity. If right? I just let, um, let you run here and do an open field, um, when you think about humans and our our continued evolution and the track of technology and how parallel and intersecting these seemingly are in the future, where do you think we're headed? You know, I think that I think that 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 integration that 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 merge point um a is gonna is gonna occur probably faster than we can even imagine right now that that's my hypothesis first from the time standpoint just given like to your earlier points how everything is changing so fast and looking at the trends in the past um i think we're definitely heading towards that place where 
that integration of the two is 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 not only going to be be it's not going to be avoidable it's going to become necessary right. and, and kind of common day mm -hmm. practice for sure what i don't know and i can't really even think is like w what's going to happen like that does one take over in a sense right does the you know right. technology you know take over and and i don't want to say enslaves human beings like are we heading right. to the matrix type of world in in a sense right i think we're already dependent yeah. a lot on technology right um but i think that i, I think that that dependency is is, is just going to continue growing as the power of, of computing you know um, enhances if you will it is wild so, when you think about it the there's some there's a lot of risks that we have to figure out on a local level right of climate issues and population issues and how to feed and and whether there's so many things that like we must figure out now for the longevity of our civilization but then there's some bigger time scale issues that also have to be solved for if you think about a need to discover how to create or sustain life outside of our planet as there's more people and you think about this merging of of machines and humans it's really almost for sure it's inevitable given the tracks we just talked about unless some sort of really overpowering governing body shut it down altogether uh, but it's almost necessary because if you think about it, the, the computations that will have to be done and the conceptualization and creativity, actually, oddly enough, mm -hmm. to solve for these big problems, like how to tr how to move at the speed of light, for example, maybe that's not something that humans can figure out. Maybe we are we're limited to a degree, but the same way that AlphaGo sees the chessboard differently than the human sees, maybe so too the integration with artificial intelligence will be able to see physics or quantum physics in a way that we cannot ever possibly view. And mm -hmm. in that is actually salvation to some degree, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, who knows how far that timeline out, but to me, there is something very exciting about that scary but exciting no doubt i mean definitely definitely exciting right as long as we do things for the for the right reasons and find the right benefits to to kind of reap if you will out of the ai not just financial but other benefits for human beings right um for technology i will so, uh, yeah i think that look at it as, as crazy as the world is that we live in right now um i think there's always opportunities like these that we can leverage and, and and help us to create a better world right we just have yes. to do it right we have to have the right the right focus um and um and and put 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 some work into it it's, it's yeah. not going to happen for us right so i think that's the key well alex we've gone longer than i thought and it moved faster than we probably both thought it would but i thank you again so much for taking the time to talk about this i, I find this stuff absolutely fascinating and I'm very excited to see what you do over at Trust Vector from our discussion and reading about it. It just seems like such a necessary step to have more businesses and, and people thinking the way that you guys are over there. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I, uh, it's been great talking to you and, and, you know, thank you for, for the kind words. We, you know, we truly believe in our mission of advancing trust between humans and machines. And um, I, you know, I'm confident we'll get there um, and uh, you know, the more the more people focus on it the better it will be for everyone so thanks absolutely a lot. thank you